This week, though, we are concluding a series that I've titled, We Are Living Hope. And this series, I hope you've enjoyed it. I have. It's been all about the power of our testimony, the power of stories of lives that have been changed by the message of the gospel, that have been changed by the love of God. And we've heard stories of people within our body, within this community of faith, who have been changed by what God is doing in Living Hope, by what Jesus is doing in their lives. And it's awesome. Um, But we're also looking at stories of biblical characters whose lives were changed by the love and the power of God. And so we've talked about Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Zacchaeus. Uh, we've talked about the prodigal son's father. Um, we've gone through all these different stories. The thief on the cross. Last week we talked about the apostle Paul and this amazing story of a life that was changed from a religious fanatic to a man who was sold out to the love of Jesus and who ended up writing half the New Testament and changing the world. Still, his influence can be felt today. And so uh, if you missed that, you can, all, you can always, we are putting these messages on our YouTube page. We're putting them on our Facebook page, obviously, as you're watching right now. Um, so check those out. Get caught up. Maybe you're new here. Um, make sure we're on the same page. But this week, though, uh, we're going to <clears throat> we're going to conclude this series by talking about one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And I think maybe it's somebody that I relate to the most. And, um, and I don't know, I just love sharing stories. And that's what this series is about. I love sharing stories of lives that have been changed, of how God brought me out of a place of, of a life that was headed toward the dumps. And, and, but God changed me and transformed me. And, you know, do, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Do I make mistakes? You bet. That's my wife. Um, but I'm different. And now I have hope. And that's what this whole series is about. And so today we're going to conclude it with one of my favorite stories. Um, and so this Sunday, what, what we're, and we're not, I know we're not together today, but this Sunday is a big deal in our faith. This is known as Ascension Sunday. This is the Sunday that historically Jesus would have, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he would have um, told the disciples that you would be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And he would, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he would have told them that he was sending the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, and that uh, the, the disciples were to go and to wait on the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus would have ascended up to heaven. And then the disciples would have been in this waiting period. And then next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, which is the the Sunday historically where the Holy Spirit would have fallen on the disciples and all of a sudden they would have been begin moving with power and authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. But one of those disciples truly experienced a radical transformation on this Sunday, on Ascension Sunday. And we're going to be going through the story of Peter today, one of my most favorite biblical characters But before we get into today's message, let's go ahead and pray. Let's ask God to bless our time together. Would you guys join me? So Jesus, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that you have sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. That even now, Holy Spirit, you are here. We thank you for the story of Peter, for a life that was transformed by the power of God, by the love of Jesus. We thank you, God, that you always give us the opportunity to change. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me today, God. Bless our time together this morning as we're all in our homes and we're uh, listening to this message and Lord, looking to be equipped by you. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. So who was Peter? Um, If you've ever read the Bible, if you've ever read the New Testament, I'm sure you've heard of this guy named Peter. Uh, Peter was one of the 12 disciples that was called by Jesus when Jesus began his ministry, uh, which was three years on earth. Peter was one of the disciples, one of the 12 disciples that Jesus called. And um, that word disciple just means a follower of. Uh, and, and we see in Peter's life, he goes from the difference between a disciple and an apostle. Um, that word disciple means a follower of. So Peter becomes a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And then he kind of transforms into an apostle, which means a sent one. Somebody who's a starter. Um, and and the, the apostles were the ones who started the faith that we have today under the lordship of Jesus. And, and so um, it was Jesus who 
spoke to Peter and spoke to the other disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, when he told them that you will be my witnesses. I'm sorry, that's Acts 1.8. When he said, therefore go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I will be with you always till the end of the age. That is, Jesus was speaking to Peter, speaking to the disciples, and we are disciples, speaking to us. And so it's often thought that um, a lot of people are thinking that uh, a line of thought is that the book of Mark is actually not written by Mark, but was dictated by Mark. And what you're reading when you read the book of Mark is actually the gospel, Jesus's story from Peter's perspective. It's the account of Jesus from Peter's eyes, which is really cool to think about. So Peter was around the same age as Jesus. And so we're looking at about a a 30-year-old man, maybe late 20s, early 30s, but around the same age as Jesus. And uh, and he was originally named Simon. And eventually Jesus changed his name to Peter. But Peter was a fisherman by trade. Now, um, he was in business with his brother Andrew. And uh, Peter and Andrew were also in business with two other brothers, brothers John and James. Um, And they were in this fishing business together. Now, if you know anything about fishermen back in the day, fishermen were the men's men of that day. You were not a fisherman unless you were a man's man. You were tough, you were vulgar, you were uh, strong, and you had to be to weather the storms and to weather all these, uh, the, the difficulties that came with the life of being a fisherman. And so Jesus encounters Peter when he's out with his brother Andrew and John and James, and they're out fishing, and they're doing their thing, doing what fishermen do, but they've had an incredibly unsuccessful day of fishing. They haven't caught anything. And so here Jesus shows up on the scene. And could you imagine, like, uh, you're out there doing what you do. You've always done what you do. You know how to do what you do. And then all of a sudden, this guy that you've never really met before comes up and says, hey, why don't you try something a little different? And so Jesus says, why don't you throw your nets to the other side of the boat? And, you know, I'm sure they could sense something was different about Jesus. And so just to maybe appease him, they tossed their nets on the other side of the rope, or on the other side of the boat, and then something miraculous happens. All of a sudden, they catch so many fish in one net throw that their nets are beginning to break and burst, and the ships, their boats are beginning to sink. And all of a sudden, Peter realizes there is something different about this man. And immediately, Peter's reaction was to fall to his knees because he realizes the reality of who Jesus is, at least some semblance of the reality of who Jesus is, hits Peter. And he falls to his knees and he says to Jesus, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. What's amazing is this is an instant. Peter Peter recognizes his unholiness his mess, his vulgar, sinful self, and the presence of a truly amazing Savior. So Peter's immediate reaction is to cower in front of Jesus in shame, expecting such a holy and perfect God to just cast him out of his sight. But Jesus... He always does this. He does something extraordinary. He does something absolutely mind-boggling. And he looks at this man who expects to be cast aside because of his sin, because of his vulgarity, because of who he is. Jesus looks at this man and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Man. Jesus doesn't look at him and say, listen, Simon, You've messed up, man. You've lived this vulgar life. Why don't you clean yourself up? And I'm going to come back in about a week and a half, uh, maybe you know, a couple weeks. I'm going to go, go over to Capernaum and hang out on the beach and, and uh, just kind of soak up the sun a little bit. And when I get back, if you've cleaned yourself up, then you can come and follow me. He doesn't look at Peter and say, you know, if you begin looking and reevaluating at your life and realize that you've messed up and you've done all these things wrong and you begin maybe making an action plan with 10 points where you can begin taking out those steps and walking in the right direction, then maybe we can talk about you coming and follow me. No. 
right in the middle of Peter's mess, right in the middle of his, of his brokenness, Jesus looks at him, a sinful man, and says, follow me and everything will change for you. It's awesome. From that moment on, Peter is not only a disciple of Christ, but he becomes a close friend of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And he kind of becomes this unofficial leader of this ragtag group of 12 disciples, 12 followers of Jesus. But you know what I think is amazing is in this moment where Peter is kind of cowering in shame before Jesus and Jesus looks at him and says, uh, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Oh, I think what we see, what we get a glimpse of in Peter's life is this, this truth, this reality that Peter was a slave. We get a glimpse of his own personal identity and the fact that Peter was a slave to other people. He was a slave to the opinion of others. He was a slave to what other people thought of him. It's no secret, I, I, I've told you guys, Peter is one of my favorite biblical characters. And I think it's maybe because, like I said, I, I relate to Peter in a lot of different ways. Peter was like, if you were in, you know, if you remember high school, you remember middle school, you remember that kid who sat at the back of the class? You know, he like never really paid attention um, and, 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 and he just kind of shouted things out just to get attention. Like he would, he's kind of the class clown and that was Peter. And honestly, that was me when I was in, in school too. But, but that was Peter. You know, he was just kind of just said things. He just spoke off the top of his head just to try and either impress people just to be heard or whatever. But Peter... And when you look at his life from the moment that he accepts Jesus or begins to follow Jesus and, and all the way to when Jesus um, is, is, is arrested, Peter is constantly just looking for the approval of others. He's the first to speak up in the group, whether people wanted him to or not. He, he spoke up for everybody else. He spoke up for people in the group. Uh, when Jesus tried to wash Peter's feet in John chapter 13, Peter boldly says that he would never allow Jesus to wash his feet. Then when, Peter, when Jesus looks at Peter and says, I have to wash your feet, Peter. Peter looks at him and says, well, then wash all of me. Wash my entire body. You know, he was just, he was he was just brash and bold. In Matthew chapter 14, it was Peter who steps out of the stormy waters when Jesus is walking toward them. And it's Peter who steps out of the boat and walks toward Jesus and begins sinking because he takes his eyes off of Jesus. Peter rebuked Jesus. Yeah, there's that. Peter rebukes Jesus for, uh, for speaking of his own death in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, again, Peter is the one who... Um, out of turn, exclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In John 18, it's Peter who, uh, when Jesus is being arrested, Peter pulls out a sword and thump, lops off this guard's ear. And Peter basically looks at him and says, would you put that thing away? And then he picks up the ears and puts the ear back on the Roman guard. It was Peter in Matthew chapter 26 who exclaimed at the Last Supper when Jesus said, you will deny me three times. Peter said, Lord, I would never deny you. And we know how that turned out. You see, I was a lot like Peter. I'm a, I'm a natural people pleaser. It's, it's one, of my, um, one of my weaknesses. I'm a natural yes man. I want to make everybody happy around me. I would like to see everyone be pleased with me. I want to see everybody like me. And that was Peter. And that was me. Before Christ, I found myself as a prisoner to the opinion of others. I found myself wanting everybody to know me, everyone to like me. I was constantly seeking the approval of others. You see, before Christ, I was, uh, I was in high school. I was the class clown. I was the life of the party. Um, to everyone else, this life of the party-ness, this class clown nature came off as confidence. Um, it came off as like I knew who I was and, and I didn't care what anybody thought of me. But deep down, really, it was really just the manifestation of deep insecurity in my own life. Of just praying and hoping beyond all hope that people would just like me. I wasn't confident at all. I was insecure. And 
I may have seemed funny on the outside, but I was just inside secretly seeking the approval of everybody around me. I found my value, my worth, and what other people thought about me and whether they liked me or not. And when that opinion that people had of me began to wane, all of a sudden I now began to find myself sitting in the middle of my brokenness and confusion and being alone and not knowing where to turn. And it was in that moment of my brokenness and my isolation that Jesus met me where I was and that my life was transformed by the love and the goodness of God and that God spoke to me that what mattered most was what he thought of me. Now, that's not to say that I don't ever struggle with that now, but I find my identity in Jesus. Peter was a prisoner to the opinions of others. Ironically, even though he was a devoted follower of Christ, he was a disciple, a follower of Jesus, I think that Peter was a slave to even the opinion of God, of Jesus. And you might look at it and say, well, that's a good thing. You know, if you want to be a slave to somebody's opinion, you probably want to be a slave to the opinion of Jesus. <clears throat> but the thing is, is you can see that from the moment that Jesus called Peter to follow him, Peter now lives his life trying to just simply get the approval of God. Every single move Peter makes, every word he says, every action he does is to simply seek the approval of God. Try and find the right words. Try and do all the right things. Say all the right things. Uh, pray all the right prayers. Um, step out at the right moment. He was just trying to please God instead of simply just being a friend with God. Working and striving for the approval of God when really it's not his actions that, that grant Peter God's approval. It's his identity. It's who he is. He's God's son. You see, Peter's enslavement to the approval of others when after Jesus' arrest, and we see it, it's clear. And he's, Jesus has taken off and he's heading into his first trial. And Peter has spent the last three years with Jesus trying to seek God's approval, trying to seek Jesus' approval. Jesus is arrested and Peter could have gone into the trial, but yet he stays out. And he's out inside in this courtyard and this little girl, I don't know, maybe 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, this little girl recognizes him and looks at him and says, hey, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? And all of a sudden, that enslavement, those chains just get a little tighter. And Peter says, whoa, 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 no, 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 you, no, no, you got the wrong guy. And then another and Peter says, whoa, no, uh-uh, no, 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 not me, not me. I didn't follow Jesus, no. And then another. And sure enough, exactly what Jesus said was going to happen, Peter, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows happened. Maybe you felt yourself in that place. You just want to be liked. You just want to have the approval of others. You just, you just want to be loved. You just want to be known. Maybe you felt invisible in a really crowded world, but sometimes it can feel very isolating. That was Peter. And today, whether you see yourself as chosen by God, as chosen by Jesus or not, you today you need to know you are. Jesus looks at you in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your sin, in the middle of your poor decisions and bad mistakes. He looks at you and he says, follow me. I love you. Today, you need to understand that God's love for you knows no bounds. That the extreme love that reached Peter it's the same love that God uses to reach out to you today. And so Jesus calls Peter. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus calls Peter. And, and he says, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And, and you might think that, okay, like when, G, when Peter decides to follow Jesus in that moment, Peter went from, from a fisherman to a fisher of men. 
But I really don't think that's the case. I think the process of Peter becoming a fisher of men and, um, and, and really that whole process is a, is a long process. I think it took three years at least for Peter to really understand what that meant. For three years, Peter was in training to be a fisher of men. He went from a fisherman to a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And three years of discovering not only who Jesus was, but discovering who he was while following Jesus, because of Jesus. And we get to experience Peter's transition from a fisherman to a disciple. And in that amazing encounter, when Jesus calls Peter from, from his boat to follow him, Peter immediately becomes a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And we have the, ama the amazing opportunity to witness Peter's transformation while seeing the middle of his struggles, while seeing him in the middle of his failures, while seeing him in the middle of his insecurities, his spiritual battles, his emotional battles, even right down to the moment where Peter denies Jesus three times. We get to witness it all. And I can't even begin to imagine the shame that Peter was experiencing in that moment that he denied Christ three times after three years of devoting his life to Jesus. In a moment, he denies him three times. But then, through Scripture, we get to see, we have the amazing opportunity to get to see Peter go from a disciple to a fisher of men. This transition into a fisher of men begins, I think, in two specific instances. The first is found in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. And it's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture because to me, it is the most intimate, raw moment where we see the pure love and forgiveness of Jesus for those that he loves. And this beautiful exchange between Peter and Jesus, this Peter who's ashamed and he's broken. So in this story in Luke chapter 21, 15 through 19, what's already happened is that Peter's denied Christ. Jesus has gone to the cross. He's breathed his last. He's been buried in the tomb and now he's risen from the grave. And in verse 15 of John chapter 21, Jesus is sitting with Peter and he says this, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And Jesus says to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. He was talking about Peter's death. And after saying that, he said to him, follow me. It's in the moment, in this moment, that Jesus looks at Peter in the middle of his brokenness in the middle of Peter's overwhelming shame, Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, I choose you. Nothing has changed from the moment I called you. Nothing has changed. Your fear, your failure, your insecurities, your mistakes, your denial, none of it can stop my love for you. I choose you, follow me, because I love you. It's after that beautiful exchange between Peter and Jesus that Jesus then ascends into heaven, promising to send another, a comforter, the, the Holy Spirit. 
And he tells the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he tells them to go and wait, which that word wait in the Greek is uh, perimeno, which just means to abide, to linger, to just be in the presence of God, to remain. And that's the first moment that we truly see Peter go from a disciple to a fisher of men, and it's because of the love of God. The second instance, the second moment that Peter steps into the realm of being a fisher of men and an apostle is found in the book of Acts chapter two. And this, this is the moment where everything changes. Where everything that Jesus says in John 21, where he looks at Peter and he says, feed my sheep. That comes to fruition And we see Peter step into his identity as an apostle. Some 2,000 years ago, God sent the Holy Spirit to dwell among us, to be our comforter, to be the one who convicts us, to be the one who gives us peace in the middle of all the storms that we experience, the one who moves through us so that the world can experience the radical love of God. The one who would be the very power of God that lives and dwells and moves inside of us, God's people. And it was on that day, the day of Pentecost, that the followers of Jesus had been waiting in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell in a mighty and powerful way, giving the uh, the people the ability to speak in the language of other people around them. And they began speaking and proclaiming in those people's languages the goodness of God and the power of God. And it was on that day, some 2,000 years ago, that Peter... Peter stepped from the role of being a disciple to being a fisher of men. It was the moment that Peter chose to stand up and proclaim Jesus boldly to thousands of people. Let me read to you what happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 14 and it says, That's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to even get drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Who gets drunk at 9 a.m.? But this is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy. Also your daughters, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And when the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous. And whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen carefully to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man thoroughly accredited accredited by God to you, the miracles and wonders and signs that God did through him are common knowledge. This Jesus, following the deliberate and well-thought-out plan of God, was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands and was handed over to you. And you pinned him to a cross and killed him. But God untied the death ropes and raised him up. Death was no match for him. David said it all. I saw God before me for all time. Nothing can shake me. He's right by my side. I'm glad from the inside out, ecstatic. I've pitched my tent in the land of hope. I know you'll never dump me in Hades. I'll never even smell the stench of death. You've got my feet on the life path with your face shining sun around me. Dear friends, let me be completely frank with you. Our ancestor David is dead and buried. His tomb is in plain sight today. But being also a prophet and knowing that God had solemnly sworn that a descendant of his his would rule his kingdom, seeing far ahead, he talked of the resurrection of the Messiah. No trip to Hades, no stench of death. This Jesus God raised up. And every one of us here is a witness to it. Then raised to the heights at the right hand of God and receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out the spirit he had, he had just received. This is what you see in here today. For David himself did not ascend to heaven, but he did say, God said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a stool for resting your feet. 
All Israel then know this. There is no longer room for doubt. God made him master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on a cross. Cut to the quick, those who were listening asked Peter uh, and the other uh, apostles, brothers, brothers, so what do we do now? And Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our Master God invites. He went on in this vein for a long time, urging them over and over, get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word. They were baptized, and they signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, the prayers. <laughs> that doesn't seem, sound like the same Peter that Jesus called three years ago, standing on that boat with his brother. Peter was changed, and it was through Peter stepping into the greatness of God, stepping into everything that God had for him, that God called him into three years earlier that the church began. It's the reason you're sitting, listening to this today. It's the reason we do meet in this building when we're able to. It's because Peter stepped into the fullness of what God had for him. Today, Peter's story should give you hope. I find hope in Peter's story because it assures me, it reminds me that even though I fail, that even though I make mistakes and mess up, even though I falter, even though I doubt myself and I, sometimes I doubt God, God will still use me if I allow him to. And he gives the same promise to you. Today you may find yourself, maybe you were right where Peter was, stuck in your sin thinking, how could God possibly use me? Yet Jesus looked right into Peter's eyes in the middle of Peter's failure. He said, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. Today, if you've never chosen to follow Jesus, and you know that God has called you to something more than what you're doing, today is the day that you can accept Christ, that your life can change. And you too can experience the radical love of Jesus just like Peter did, just like the, maybe the person sitting next to you has, just like I have. If that's you, I want you to join me in this prayer. You can pray out loud. You can pray in your heart. It doesn't matter. Just mean it. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Let's pray. I want you to repeat after me. Jesus, I need you. I recognize that I'm a sinful person and that without you, I'm lost. I believe that you died on the cross for me and that you rose from the grave three days later. I believe in you. I give you my life. I love you, Jesus. Change me from the inside out. Amen. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your unending grace that even though we fall to our knees like Peter and we know that we're not good enough, I thank you, God, that you still choose us. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here today. Even though we're not in the church building, we thank you, God, that it's just a building, that we, the people, are the church, and that you move through your church today, and that we can celebrate your power. God, I pray that you would bless everybody that's listening, everybody that's watching, and help us to all be transformed by the love and the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, if you decided to follow Jesus we are celebrating with you. I would love it if, if you could let us know. Comment below. Let us know that you've chosen to follow Jesus today. Fill out a guest card, a digital guest card. Let us know through that. We want to celebrate with you because today is the day that you have been transformed into a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. 
for everybody else to know that even though we mess up every single day, know that there is hope through the love of God. I love you guys. Have an amazing week of worship. Be on the lookout for that update sometime late this next week or early the following week. We will have that update on when we're going to be reopening. Have an amazing week of worship. Continue to change this city with the message of the gospel of Jesus. Thank you.